first time, but I will. So tonight is B Talks, of course, but then we're having our first workshop this Saturday. And if you haven't registered for, register for it and want to come, um, I would encourage you to go. This is our, uh, I don't know, what would you call it? Our initial or our, our um, inaugural, inaugural um, <laughs> workshop at our new B yard. All right. So that's on, um, it's this Saturday at 9 a.m. And it is, it will cover some nucleus hives, supering and summer management workshop. So we have a brand new bee yard. We have five wonderful colonies over there, plus a top bar hive. I'm gonna go through two or three of them. And I'll also show you the natural progression and comb building in a top bar hive, if that's something that interests you and you wanna learn how to do. We have one that's functional and operational and looks pretty healthy. Now I haven't opened them in 25 or 26 days. So um, we're gonna discover that together, but note the new address, Boulder No Community Farm, 875 Boulder Road. And people are able to find that. So I'm kind of encouraged that it's, uh, if you put that in your GPS, you will get there. Um, uh, and you'll see a big, uh, you'll see us there at that point. And um, we're going to park in a grass field. We have plenty of parking and we'll have a great time. There's 83 people already registered for the event, but I want to encourage everybody who is not currently registered and wants to come, please do. We have plenty of room for everyone. Um, 83 people won't come, so uh, that'll be good. And if you, um, I want to also encourage you, if you're here at B Talks, and I'm glad you are, I'm glad to see all of you, actually. I'm glad to be back in the United States also. Um, <clears throat> but if you're not a member of CBA, I always encourage you to please join. Um, we encourage that mem membership for a number of reasons. It supports all of our programs, and our program planner, Elizabeth, is busy at getting two or three wonderful speakers, one for the end of the year. We have a whole speaker lineup. Our next one is Kara Wagner. You can see her. She's on June 23rd. And um, she is a great speaker. And I'm, and I'm looking, we're looking forward to her talk. She's going to talk about chemical communication, or basically pheromonal communication. And I think you'll enjoy that talk. And that's uh, 6.30 PM to 8. And that's next week, uh, June 23rd. And then we have a, a lineup of, uh, you know, we continue to, I'm just going to roll, I'm rolling down now so you can see the rest of our, our, we have Jay Evans, we have a friend of mine, Mary Ann Frazier, I travel in Africa with her, she's going to be talking about um, uh, beekeeping in Kenya, um, and then we have um, Aaron Anderson, Benefic Beneficial Bee Habits, Reducing Pesticide Risks, and then we go on to uh, Kimberly Stoner from uh, the Ag Station in New Haven. And she's gonna talk about native pollinators is very interesting and totally professional um, expert on native pollinators. And she's talking about native pollinators in Connecticut. So she worked at the lab at the um, Ag Station for her, I think her entire career. Maybe not, she's um, um, a wonderful speaker and a wonderful person. She recently retired from the lab. so. We're giving her something to do. Now that's in November, but we have booked Christina Grosinger for December. We're looking at Matilla Heather for um, early February. And we have three or four speakers, heavy hitters lined up for um, next year already, 2023. So stay with us. We have a good program going forward. We hope, hope to be able to teach you lots of things about beekeeping or you can learn yourself or you can teach me. You know, so I'm going to start off before we get to Re Rebecca's question. I'm going to start off with June's bloom calendar. Now, this uh, has 21 data on it, but I have I'll update that to, to 22 once I get my notes together. I haven't had a chance to do that. Hold on. What happened there? OK, so um, you'll notice a lot of plants bloom in uh, in June. Now, um, I'm going to go through this list, but if any of you have any other plants that you know of or have seen that's not on this list, please speak up. Um, and, but you can see them lavender. I'm not going to, you can see them all. I'm not going to read them all. Um, but I will um, point out some ones that end up in my honey. One is poison ivy, which is, um, so this is what I know from June, from about five or six years of um, uh, my study of area 
area um, blooms that I've seen my my bees on. And don't ask how I know they're my bees because I really don't. But I assume they are because they're in the they're in the forage range for my area. So um, as I said, lavender is a little bit uh, holly, a little bit of uh, beekeeping. That's sort of a that's a cultivar. Uh, American holly trees are are. They come around in the beginning of June. They're probably gone by at this point, but they are just loaded with bees when they're on. Poison ivy um, is, is something that ends up in my honey, so it's um, um, uh, so it's a, it's usually a good source. Uh, Chinese privets around smooth sumac was an absolute stunning display of um, of uh, flowers this year. How, why these things happen, I'll never know, but. Um, more spikes on smooth sumac. That's the first, by the way, uh, sumac that blooms followed by uh, two other sumacs, staghorn and wing sumac, which come on later on um, in the same month. Now we have um, small leaf linden, which is a native, uh, native viburnum, alternate leaf dogwood, which I don't see on here, but will be in June. I might have to add that. Um, elderberries out and that bees work that. Common milkweed is the feature for June, in my opinion, just from the beauty of watching bees forage on native milkweed. Of course, swamp milkweed comes out and uh, butterfly weed and all that also comes out and bees work them. But the real winner in um, observational uh, delight is uh, the common milkweed. And also common milkweed will is the, is the monarch butterfly's um, <clears throat> passage to uh, sustain passageway while, while they migrate north. Canada thistle, to the extent that uh, your towns want to eradicate that from the fields, uh, it hangs tough. It's a great bee forage. And um, staghorn sumac comes in June. And then we have, like I said, swamp milkweed. If there's a buckwheat, field near you, it'll bloom around the end of June. And then the sustainer that most of us miss, but is interesting to look for is dogbane, which uh, you'll see bloom at the end of, it's setting wonderful uh, buds at this point, but it's, it's at, the end, at the end of June, it'll, it'll flower and it'll, and it'll flower all summer long, almost till fall. And it, um, uh, it's a, what I refer to as the sustainer because it's a bloom that you, your, your bees can count on when if they get into a little dearth. And then my favorite unreliable bloom of the year is uh, largely for American basswood. And if that flowers and like it looks like it's starting to set its brats, which are little um, formations that occur on the end of leaves or near near the end of um, a branch leaves. And they, that's where the flower cups develop. They look like little tulips and they hold an extraordinary amount of nectar and it makes wonderful, wonderful honey, if it blooms. All right, has anybody seen anything else? Cinqua foil, that's Italian. Okay, cinqua, okay, all right. Cinque. Yeah. Um, so I found that in the woods, as well as foxglove beard tongue right here down the street from my little home here. And that looks like it's a lovely bee. Oh, yeah. Foxglove is wonderful. I don't have that. My... So when did you notice that that stuff bloomed? Uh, this past weekend on a walk. All right. All right. So I'm going to add that. I'll add that. Uh, I'll, I'm going to add that in there on, on your date. Um, Yes, great uh, foxglove. Well, of course, fox foxglove is just. By the way, you know, I mean, a bloom calendar, having a bloom calendar and looking at flowers is one of the best parts of beekeeping. It's just you're looking at beautiful plants all the time, and trying to figure out when they bloom and whether or not your bees work them. Don't miss the opportunity to be um, to look at plants and um, and enjoy that part of beekeeping. You know, we're constantly. Uh, anxious about the biology of our, our colonies. and um, But bees bring you into a larger ecosphere and a much larger world of joy when you start looking at the flowers they, um, they forage on. Lupine also, is lupine up, Amy? 
It's in Hebron. Yes, I just, um, I'm in Hebron, Connecticut, and I have two blooms. All right. It's huge in Bridgewater. Oh, and in, and if, again, you know, if you don't, if you find a field. Got it in Brantford. You got it in Brantford. This is all, these are all wild. <laughs> saw it in Guilford, too. Wonderful. So lupine is another one. You know, it, you know that if you can, it, it's just stunningly beautiful in my opinion. Um, and um, if you get to see that, um, <clears throat> wait, catnip is that catnip or is nepeta? Is that it's nep? Bill, it's nepeta. It's nepeta. cat mint. It's nepeta. Yeah. It's cat mint. Not catnip. And, no, not catnip. Right. And it's interesting. It's very, very fragrant. And I have about a half a dozen nepeta or catmint shrubs next to my hives. And the bees tend to go to it when they're desperate. So after a rain or on a, a breezy day, they tend to go to the nepeta. And it's been blooming now up here for about two weeks. But it's incredibly fragrant, lovely uh, perennial. Oh, cool. All right. So it's an it's. Is it a cultivar or a native? It's a cultivar. All right, okay. So cultivars can provide you with a little sustenance now and then. Exactly. Plus it's the not their crumb. That we have St. John's wort that's in bloom in Brantford. Okay, St. John's wort. All right, so that that's, I pulled that out of my garden, unfortunately. I used to have that, a timer for that. So St. John's wort is another one. All right, great. All right. Um, uh, no, they're not all good for nectar and pollen. All right, so um, you know you can get either nectar or pollen, or a lot of them. A um, lot of them are do provide both, but um, but not all of them do. Well, milkweed, for instance, provides nectar only. Common milkweed, you can't. These it's milkweed is designed to keep its pollen and not let the bee have it. <laughs> It's kind of interesting. Staghorn, sumac, you'll get nectar and pollen, all the sumacs, uh, the swamp meads. Oh, chicory, I forgot to mention chicory is that little blue flower that you see, um, very simple blue flower. It's on the side of the road and you see it's kind of a, pur it's a purplish blue, but it blooms all summer and it starts to bloom this, this, um, this period. Honeysuckle is out, yes. Um, I don't see bees. These don't have the proboscis for honeysuckle, I don't think. Do you, have you seen them go in that plant, Lauren? I have not seen them go in that plant, but it's definitely, it's pulling me in. I assume it'll pull in the bees too. Yeah, well, no, yeah, because it's so fragrant, you mean. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, now, yellow trumpet flower, which you would think um, is to, is in the same category as um, honeysuckle. Bees will go inside of that because they can. Honeysuckle, the plant, you'll, you'll see hummingbirds on that and uh, any other long proboscis uh, kind of uh, pollinator will also be able to use that. Um, maybe some bats, or but mostly hummingbirds I see on mine and, um, um, and not bees, but maybe you'll see a bee on there. Who knows? Sometimes they do strange things. Wild lilies, what are those, Lee? Wild lilies. What is a wild lily? So it's purple. I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them in my backyard. Yes. And I tried to do a plant uh, recognize, use a plant recognizer app yes. because I thought it was a weed. And it said that it was from the lily family. It's a tiny little purple flower. And they're very, they're very uh, um, intrusive. These, they just grow everywhere and it's hard to control. And did you so, see the bees working? Yeah. And I've seen the carpenter bees and uh, uh, honey, honey bees. Um, uh, uh, we caught two swarms on Memorial Day weekend. And I'm guessing these honey bees could be from these uh, uh, beehives nearby. We caught the swarms down the street near the beehives. <laughs> They're yours. No, no, they weren't ours. No, oh, no, no. okay. There's so, somebody so, else. So, so, so Father Mark has uh, four hives on his property in his backyard. He sent me a message. Hey, you won't believe what I see in my backyard. I see a swarm. They're not mine. 
I went over there. We, we, I helped him catch that swarm. The next day there was another swarm. Neither swarm were, were his. Mm -hmm. However, there is a man down the street that has like eight hives. It could be him, but we don't know. No. Okay. Um, all right. So, okay. So let's get on to Rebecca's question then. Thank you. Um, so I went and checked out my hives today. I have two. And one has um, a new queen that I saw that started laying about three weeks ago and beautiful patterns. And the other one is just as happy and everything looked very healthy, except that I saw for the first time ever um, about a dozen bees with uh, small deformed wings. Yeah. Tiny wings, shriveled wings. Yeah. Um, and only in one hive, not in my second hive with the new queen, um, only in the other. And I'm leaving Saturday. Um, and so I'm kind of wondering, should I do my Formic Pro tomorrow? The, the, the colony that you're seeing deformed wing. So let's, let's, for the benefit of everybody that's, yep. that's on the call, let's talk a little bit about deformed wing virus, which is what you're seeing. Deformed wing virus is a crippling um, uh, viral attack on bees. It usually will not, they can, they can handle a certain amount of deformed wing virus, but when it gets into their, the ganglia in their head, then it, defect, it affects the formation of their wings and they're kind of useless to the colony at that point. They die early, um, but it's a sign of lots, a high volume, a high viral load in the colony, which means that there's also a high varroa Mm -hmm. population in that colony. So at this point, you you should treat yep. your colony and uh, with whatever you have. Uh, formic. Okay, so I have formic and in, in autumn, um, when I did not have a lot of capped brood, I buttoned them up with oxalic acid dribble. Yeah, I know, but this colony overwintered, right? Yes, it did, sir. Yes, it did. So yeah, that's yeah, what I'm yeah. asking. Yeah, I'm no. wondering temperature wise, timing wise, because last time I used Formic Pro, it was later into the summer season. No, but you're, I, you're good all next week for for for, for Great, me. so that could be my plan. Now, the only other question is- Well, it won't, it won't solve the virus problem. Okay, but maybe prevent it from getting worse? Yeah, it, 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 it will it'll likely prevent it from getting worse, but Formic okay. Pro will kill mites, but not it doesn't clean the colony out of viruses. That's all. The okay. viral load has already been vectored into the bees. Okay. That's the point. So do point. I, the other, do I put my, um, I have a screen bottom board. Should I put my draw in while I do the formic? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And um, you can put your draw in, but you have to leave the, your enough ventilation and you follow the, follow the instructions. There. Yes, sir. The instructions on the, on the, on the box are very clear. Okay. So, so do you up. think that, I didn't see anything like this three weeks ago um, when I last inspected. Well, it was a little, uh, maybe two and a half weeks ago. Um, and like I said, I saw about a dozen today. Yeah, that's, a lot. that's a lot of them. That's enough. Okay. That's my concern. I mean, am I in jeopardy? You're, you have to treat the colony and see what happens. Do I treat both hives or just the infected I would hive? treat both hives. Okay. Uh, because you, you all know, right is there anything else i can do other than tree and fingers crossed uh no there's nothing else you can do except measure the results where you said you're going somewhere i yes yeah, saturday um i'll be home on wednesday though i have a wedding in savannah well that's um, fine you know so what i would do is i would put a drop board under both colonies okay and i want i'd want because i want to see what kind i want to see what kind of might load you're eliminating like okay so they'll the colony, the mites will drop for days after the treatment. Yep, yep. And you'll be able to see on the bottom board how okay. fast they were. Okay. But so you should do a roll after you come back and, you know, give them, give them 10 days and then do a... And then do a roll after? Okay. See what the population is. You really want to make sure that whatever it is you did for treatment was efficacious. So you don't... Yes, sir. You're not, you don't want to guess at whether or not the, the, it worked. You want to know. Correct. If you did a roll now, you'd find a, a fairly high population of forever. Okay. No, but don't so worry about the that. The other hive that I didn't notice anything in that I'm going to treat anyhow, that has a fairly new queen. 
is that going to upset them or is that just a gamble? Like sometimes a new queen, they, you know, they don't like the treatment and they. No, the, well, the new queen is not likely to be affected as much by the formic acid as the old one is. Okay. Okay. And so that's it. good news. <laughs> well, you're coming back, right? So, I'm coming back Wednesday. Um, and I so could be there Thursday morning. So what you're going to have to make sure doesn't happen is that the treatment, formic acid treatment kills the queen. Like she might stop laying. And it, it's not necessarily that the formic acid will kill a queen, but sometimes the colony, when you put in something, um, a miticide with the strength of formic acid, what'll happen is the um, colony will ball the queen. Yes. Make her responsible for that, <laughs> even yeah. though you're the one who put it in. And then, that, right. and then she'll die in that process. But so that, so your colonies, the bottom line is your colonies have to come up queen right after the treatment. That's all. Okay. Okay. Thank you so and much. And if you have one colony that does come up queen right and one that doesn't, what will you do then, Rebecca? Um, what you taught me last year. Right. And I'm going to take some brood from the other colony and give it to the queenless colony and let them rear queen. Let's emergency queen. Right. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. Thank you very question much. quick about that. Go ahead. Amy. I heard, is it true that formic acid, when you treat with that, the queen stops laying? She could stop laying. Some don't, but, but some, some will, you know, stop laying. It's all individual, you know, and if she stops laying, she might just stop laying for a, for a day or two or a week, but she'll start laying again, Amy, and then you won't have to worry. All right, so, but that's the kind of thing you have to, that's what the animal husbandry is in the era of Varroa. You have to make sure that she starts laying again or that they didn't eliminate her. Older queens don't do as well with formic acid as younger ones do, you know, and some folks that use formic acid in off-label ways um, will tell you, commercial beekeepers will tell you that formic acid finds all their weak queens for them, you know, basically by killing them. And then, um, you know, so that's what they say. All right, cool. Thanks, Rebecca. Good luck with that colony. All right, so anybody else have anything? When do we start? Okay. Um, so I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Karen. I'm just a little frustrated. I have one hive that wintered over and it's doing fine. And I split it off and I, um, they grew, you know, there's a, a new queen in there and that's all great and the split is good. But I have two other new um, packages that I had started in April and they're going like gangbusters, but the hive had so much honey in it again that they're like getting honey bound. I had to take some honey off. I get frustrated to find when to do the honey supers when to put them on so i put them on the one that wintered over and there's some in there but um the new hives i feel like they just there wasn't a lot of room for the queen and i didn't want them to um swarm like happened to me a couple years ago so i took some honey out and but i'm frustrated i can't get a full honey super i don't not sure what i'm doing wrong well so what do you mean you took some honey out? Where'd you take the honey out of? I took some honey right out of the hive. Out of the, well, yeah, but I mean- out Covered of the, the hive. The, out the, of the brood the nest? Hive. Yes. I'll say, and because you think that the queen, you have one deep, you keep in the colonies in one deep? Two. Two, two. deep. And all the whole colony was filled with honey. Yeah, there was so much honey in there. And the last time I talked to- um the gentleman I bought them from and he said well you better take some honey out of there so I did that this year again and I mean covered it was covered not you know like what honey or anything but I can't get them to and these supers are you know have drawn comb so is a queen excluder on those supers yeah and so I try without the clean excluder what happens she's laying up there on one of them yeah yeah, they do that. I know. I know. They make you. They make you crazy. They, it's they, very they, frustrating. I'm. I'm really frustrated. Like I feel like I've done everything else right, but I just want a full super of honey so then I can say I'm a real beekeeper. 
Well, you're a real beekeeper. Even yeah, I know. Super honey. So you're saying you they won't lay, they won't put honey in drawn cone supers. Well, the only reason that they wouldn't do that, or they'd be hesitant to do that, is if there was a crown of honey right. over the top of all the frames in the top box. And so what bees do when they run into that is they define that as the upper limit of their colony. And you can put a million supers on top and they, they can, some bees are hesitant to use them. Others will cross that honey barrier, but I make sure in my production colonies that I'm always leaving them frames in the center, brood frames that don't have honey shoulders or, or just drawn comb frames that I put in there so that they have a passageway to get up into the super. Ah, uh, okay. If don't give them that passageway. They may or may not. Uh, okay. So you like checkerboard it or something? And I actually checkerboard. I, that that's not a um not that's that's a word I try to hesitate. To okay. Use. Okay. So but, you... uh, yeah. So no, I just make certain that <clears throat> uh, okay. the box below my super, my honey okay. super. Okay. Well, not does not have a shoulder of honey over all of the top frames because the bees won't work the super that way sometimes. I remember you said that. That is some great advice. Okay, right, perfect. So that's what you have to watch out for and you have to change right. that situation. Okay. And if you want, if you put one or two drawn combs and if you even have to, you know, disturb the brood nest a little bit to do that in the center, that's what you have to do, you know, and then you can get your colonies to you know, sometimes if you put your your supers on real early like with dandelions i wasn't around for i was around for dandelions because i have my colonies supered and they made a lot of honey also they're making a lot of honey but um um yeah so that's the key don't get frustrated just you're you're doing perfect nobody complain what beekeeper complains about their bees making too much honey i don't get this like well i want it up in the super so it's clean and they can just you know whatever okay thank you <laughs> super helpful okay helpful. okay wonderful thank you wonderful. all right all right what else do we got what do we got yeah down? yes go ahead. i have a i'm please uh forgive me i I'm still trying to get on, uh, get uh, acquainted with the norm, the wording that is being used. Yes, so I do better with some pictures, and I, and that's how I'm learning. Um, we have one hive. Uh, we got connected with a, a mentor who was really helpful uh, in uh, in setting us up a little bit. Um, and uh, since then, we've been feeding them. I think, as you said, in the last time I was on uh, the uh, sugar water for a while, and I have a couple of photographs that I'd like to share. Sure, and, share them up. Your opinion. Perfect. Put them up there. Okay. Um, this is what uh, is now happening. Uh, previously, the the uh, it was all uh, growing all over, and he had uh, told us to tighten up the frames and put in the the uh, feeder straight into the uh into the hive uh into that how many, frame, how many frames are like this uh right now uh i would say on the on the bottom level it's uh eight because we took one out for to put the feeder in there uh, so there's eight uh, frames that look like this with some brew uh, a little bit of honey about seven seven and a half looked like this right. and the yeah, uh, so that's that's yeah that that queen is in trouble so what i want you to do is yes. i want you to get that queen put her in a cage i'll come and get her and okay. I'll, I'll take care of her a little bit for you while you're <laughs> that's like a perfect frame oh. you know if you got seven of these you know, I'm just kidding, of course. Like, you know, this is a really good queen and that's a really nice frame to see. Okay. It's all drawn out. I mean, that's probably capped sugar water because you're still feeding them, right? Yes. Uh, or have so, they stopped taking sugar water? No, they haven't. Um, and uh, it's time for you to add another box. So we added another box uh, two weeks ago. All right. Uh, so and, how did you do that? And they, they are uh, the center ones on the on the top box are uh, the center frames are starting to look like this. Okay. Uh, but the ones on the sides are not. So we uh, are moving the frames around so that the, uh, th that's what our mentor said that we should move it so that they start to continue to, to build where uh, in the middle, since they're building in the middle, 
give them the empty places to build in the uh, the empty frames to build uh, seems to be working um i don't know so on the on the lower level we have the feeder on one end on the up, uh, upper level we've got the feeder on the other end um but the uh, upper level is at most one or two frames like this and the rest of them are still empty all right so it's going along great can't hope for uh, better than that that's perfect. On one of the lower, on this is also on the uh, lower level, we started to see a lot of th this sort of uh, emptiness. Uh, is that a problem? Well, it looks like to me that this is a frame that is all honey with a little bit of brood on the bottom. Yes. Yeah, but the rest of the center part of that is bees that have emerged. And it looks like they're back filling with honey. So it's a good time that you might have been, um, you might have, you might have waited a little too long to put that second box on. So okay. they're, back, they're back filled this brood nest with honey. But I don't think you're going to have a problem at this point. Now, what you okay. see in the center there is a. Is that, what is queen. that, that center thing right there? Okay, that's a queen formation or a queen button. There's lots of slang names for it. Um, okay. But it's the indication that bees make those. And that's their like um, insurance policy in case they need a new queen. Okay. I don't know if there are more like that. No, there's just that one, and maybe a second one here, but this, that's it. We, I looked through all the frames and uh, this is the only one that I saw. Okay, so for everybody's benefit, then when you see that formation, that queen button on your in your colony, you clear those bees away from it a little bit. You can just put your hand on it and tap it gently and the bees will move away. And then you flip that frame upside down and look inside of it, inspect it thoroughly and make sure there are no, there's not an egg in one of them or a uh, larva, which would indicate that they're intending to make a new queen, all right? So, but in this case, I'm gonna suspect that they're not, but, uh, okay. but it is good to inspect those always when you see queen buttons or queen formations. Okay. Right? Inside of them, make sure that there's no eggs inside them or larva, because then at that point, if there's an egg in them, you, you come back and check in three days. If there's larva in them, you know for certain they're making another queen and then you have to take some action. And if that, it, would that be a problem if they're making a new queen? It would, you know, so yeah, you don't really want that to happen with the beautiful queen like you have there. You want to try to Avoid that if you can, just by giving them space. This is a new colony, right? Yes, it's our yeah. first. We we got a second hive as a backup, and I've got to still put it together. Okay, so I would get ready. I would put that together if I were you. Okay. Um, so, um, and then make sure that when you close these colonies all the time, we're gonna, I'm going to demonstrate this again at the bee yard Saturday, but you always push your frame shoulders together tight, squeeze out all of the gunk. Yes. Them. Make sure that you push them all the way over the one side, squeeze them all out, and then equalize the distance between the ends. Of course, you have a feeder. In your yeah. Ears, so that's so. Possible. When we when I did that at the beginning without the feeder, uh, there was they were starting to uh, uh, sort of uh, make comb all over the place, especially in that extra space on one end or the other end, and uh, yeah, we well, have to you have to recenter the whole group of frames in the middle. Yes, that's what I did. And so you should end up with three eighths of an inch on each side. Yeah, okay. there's an extra uh, space on, on each side. Right. And, and what the, uh, that's where uh, the uh, comb was coming in all different directions. Um, well, how, and, many, how many frames you had? 10? 10. But though you had a feeder in there, so you only had nine. No, no, no. I, at that time, I didn't Before have a feeder. you had a feeder, okay. Yes. So when we when we put the feeder in, it's it's really tight, and this is what there's a big difference between what we were seeing before and after. Okay. The, what is is this the capped sugar water and uh, the yes. thing into honey? Yeah, mostly that's that's probably the capped sugar water. Yes. Okay. Um, you don't have any honey in this box. Okay. What would that you, look you know, like? The, technically, the definition for honey is from coming from a floral source. Yes, I, I uh, agree. But, you know, but some people think it's, you know, comes from the back of an aphid. Also, but, but we're, we we generally only think of honey coming from floral sources. And so this eating, real imitation honey. <laughs> uh, it, tastes, it doesn't taste good at all. It's just garbage. I know, I know. 
Okay. Right. Cool. Thank you, sir. I, I didn't inspect the hive for a couple of weeks. And then when I went back in, I saw I've, I've got two frames in the bottom deep and they kind of, they made brood and it attached between the frames so that when mm -hmm. I, pull it out, I'm kind of like shredding it. So do I scrape that level? Well, so yeah, so see what they're doing is they're they're just drawing like wild comb. They're not following the foundation. They're not following the rules you gave them. <laughs> you see, they do that, I don't know. So that's a genetic thing. Sometimes they build off the comb. I tolerate anything in my colonies that doesn't really affect the biology. If, okay, good. Well, what will happen to you in this case, I think, uh, Kathy, is that they, that will affect the bee space on the frames that are alongside of it. And that, yes, yeah. that'll end up being a problem for you because you won't, they won't draw that comb out and your comb just won't be nice. But you know what? We're backyard beekeepers, most of us. You know, I have some kind of a little bee business going. So I, I want to make sure I have production colonies and I might do something to correct that action. But what I'd like to see so you do is just work the biology the way you find it. Assuming that they're not building comb between the frames on off the surface of the frame and crowding the next B space is one thing. But if they're building bridge comb between two frames, and which means you can't pull one out without pulling right. both of them out, that you have to cut with your hive tool before you can pull it out. Okay. So so, but tolerate as much as you can from the bees. And then, um, and then uh, if, they, if they interfere with your work in a colony or they make it impossible for you to do inspections, then you have to change something. But Okay, and when I did, uh, I did have to trim, I tried it and it was, yeah. then I was afraid and I stopped. But um, so it's obviously got bees in it too, bees all over it and that. So you just scrape that off and leave it near the hive so then the bees can make their way back up. Um, well, and the brood. You mean live bees walking around on it? Yes, yes. I just smoke them off with your smoker or brush them. Right. Okay, yep. Put them off the comb before you do that. And then, um, um, you know, and then you can scrape it. You know, I thought you meant larva. It was larva, <laughs> but there was- Well, larvas, once you scrape larva out, it's gone. You know, they won't. If you leave it in the bottom of the colony, um, it may emerge. I've seen that happen in top boxes where I did tree cutouts. I just put a bunch of, uh, brood in the top box all kind of jammed in together and I and I watched that stuff emerge over the days but that's warm weather um, brood has to be kept really warm so it's not likely to emerge it's likely die but if it does die and it's still in the colony like you put it down on the bottom board or something not outside the colony but inside um, they'll they'll clean that comb out eventually and they'll recycle the protein in that larva or uh, pupa, and um, you're good. Okay, thank you very much. That'll work. All right, cool. What else we got over here? Can I just ask one more super question, quick question, Bill? Yeah. Those, fr those frames that I have that I had scraped out, they're just a, they're in a, a box now, so they're still like very wet from the honey I scraped. But how should what should I do with those? You know, I don't want to. Yeah, you want to clean them. You want those are deeps, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, so let's see, what could you do with those? Well, you could do a couple of things. How many do you have? I have about eight, six, six or eight. I have about eight and I would like to get them back into another. I think that's honey? Uh, I checked, um, oh yes, yes, on there I know it is. Yeah, for those, those colonies are honey. Can you extract it or you did? No, I did extract it. So I have these, you know, frames that they're just very wet. They're now. They're stickies, just yeah. Gonna, yeah, yeah, those are what we call, we refer to as stickies in the tree. Yes, exactly. So I don't yeah, want to put just them above. Um, so you have how many colonies? Uh, four, four. All right. So give, put, put those stickies on top of a big, strong colony that has, uh, you know, put it on top of its um, inner cover. And let them come and clean them out. Just on the inner cover and above then, the inner cover. Above the inner cover, the but close it off, cover. right? So there's no robbing, just close it. Oh yeah, you gotta close it. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. You gotta make sure you put the telescoping cover back on top of the cover. You're just trying to clean the stickies. Exactly, exactly. The same okay. way you would do it if you were gonna um like harvest honey out of a colony. Yes, so yes. Someday when you have supers that are filled, 
you'll have to do that. You know, you'll have to extract it all and then put the stickies back on. I'm going to make up a t-shirt. My supers are full. No. Okay. <laughs> so um, why would they have to be in strong? Why do they need to be put on the stronger colonies? I mean, what well, are you risking? Yeah. A strong colony will get up there and clean them up right away. I'm just thinking about the population. You know, if it's Got a it. weak colony and small, small population of bees, it'll take them longer to clean it. They may not even do it. You know, so uh, I like really strong colonies that, um, if they have a little temperament issue, they'll even do it faster. But, um, uh, you know, but uh, if they're big and strong, they'll get up there and they'll get that nectar down. And, and would you, you is, that, no, is there me. any point in putting them outside of your no, hive? No, no, yeah. The point is not to do that. Okay. Because, because if you're in any kind of a little dearth, we usually have enough floral sources through June to avoid a dearth at this time of year. But who knows in your area, there might be. But if she has she has four colonies, if she puts them outside, she can start a little robbing frenzy that would be uncomfortable for everybody around her. And actually, that was the question I've just posted, which is I've heard about the dearth over the entire last year, but I'm still what what are we looking for to know if we're in a dearth and we have to remove our supers or well you know, <clears throat> be more leery about what's happening? Yeah. So, so one of the best ways to figure out if there's a dearth or not is to get inside your colony and see what's happening in terms of nectar storage. If, you're, if your supers are still filling, then you're not in a dearth, of course. If you can shake loose nectar out of your supers on top, then you're not in a dearth. You can actually look at the, at the entrance and kind of look, backlight the bees a little bit, see if they're bringing nectar back. So if a lot of foragers are returning to your colony, they don't have pollen on them, say for instance, um, but they look a little plump. If you can look at their abdomen, their abdomen is a little extended. That means that their honey stomach is full and they're full of nectar, you can also tell. So that, that's another way we can tell if bees are bringing back nectar. My guess is they are at this point because you have to have sumac where you are and smooth sumac is, smooth sumac is out in, in um, in force. So my guess is you still have, you don't have a dearth. Now, when a dearth occurs, um, you'll know it. You know, there's, um, the way you know it is colonies will stop gaining weight. You know, there'll be some curious bees around other colonies that you have. So they'll be trying to get into other entrances. And um, so, yeah, a dearth will occur and you kind of know, you'll figure it out. And if you had a bloom calendar and you were following your blooms, um, you'd know absolutely that you were in a dearth, but keep keep an eye on what's going on in your supers. Look at the at the uh, bottom board entrance to make sure your bees are coming back rich with something, pollen or nectar, and um, and uh, you can you'll be able to tell after a while. It's it's not as easy as I'm making it sound, Sylvia. You know you have to you know you have to gain the kind of experience that you have now. You're you're gaining that. You're asking the exact right questions. Um, for like, how do you, how do you, how do you make more sense out of keeping bees? And that's one thing you have to learn, you know, are they still on a nectar flow somewhere? When they're on a nectar flow, I know it because my bees just are leaving at uh, 530 in the morning and they're, and they're coming in and out of that colony like crazy. Good, strong colony will give you an indication that there's a flow. They're not bothering with anybody else in the bee yard. You know, you can do your inspections. You're not getting a lot of bees around you you know, uh, from other colonies trying to rob honey from the colony you just opened. So there's lots of ways to tell. I live in Avon, Connecticut, but I go to school in Keene, New Hampshire. All right. Um, and I've just always wanted to be a beekeeper. Mm, me too. And I have no clue really where to start. Like I've read some handbooks and um, I went to a workshop a few or it was like at some point last summer and I got a suit for Christmas like two years ago. But other than that, I'm not super entirely sure where to start, but it's like what I really, really want to do. Yeah, so uh, so what I suggest you do is keep your reading up. You know, one, one good source we list on our website, um, we list some beginner books, especially in our mentor program. And I want you to apply for a mentor through um, Jose. Is, is our, we have an automated mentorship program at this point 
where we will try to assign um, a mentor to you based on your GPS location. So our okay. mentors are all tagged GPS and our mentees are all tagged GPS. So we kind of know who's close to whom at this point. It's an innovation that we that we um, we put together on our mentor program uh, just recently. So apply and get somebody. And what I what I think ideally I would do if I were you is not start with B's right away, but start with a mentor that can bring you through uh, their process for a little bit so that you get the feel for working live colonies, understanding the terminology, you know, understanding the biology a little bit better. When you, I'll warn you that when you first start um, becoming a beekeeper, you'll get very bee centric, meaning like you'll just concentrate on everything that's occurring inside the colony. But okay, yeah, and and that'll and that's the natural progress. That's the first thing you'll learn. Everything all about the biology, but you know the biology and that you observe in the colony, which is something you learn in time, is dependent on the ecology outside of it. So everything that yeah. occurs on the floral side of things affects the biology inside beekeeping. So the beekeeper's handbook, you read that? Yep. Uh, no amount of reading will ever make you a beekeeper. And um, so, <laughs> you know, the only thing that does is the hard knocks of trying to learn to be a beekeeper. Yeah. Sylvia yeah. is a perfect, Sylvia can help you with, <laughs> Sylvia, you can chime in if you want to, if you want at this point, because I, I know that you um, have made an effort um, to become a beekeeper and, and you might want to share a little bit of your of your... oh, other than being stunned learning by the fact that sticking stay with your suit and don't get stung make yeah. sure you're not allergic but yes yeah. Okay. oh um, yeah I'm not, I'm not allergic I've had a I've had a bit of trial no, in my life <laughs> but I've been at it for a year and um my bees did get through the winter so but um I'm happy to send you a message and you can chat me whenever that'd okay. be awesome thank you all right great I mean and so welcome uh to this extraordinary uh Ha, I guess you would want to call this hobby, <laughs> but um, um, it's also an obsession at some point. <laughs> oh yeah. So uh, yeah. So and you'll love it once you start to deal with live bees. All I'm right. like so, super excited. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, it'll work. It'll work for you. You'll have a lot of fun. And plus, you're going to be <clears throat> considered a little bit crazy. You know, so in your hey in your, Bill, you know that's are, all right. Yeah. Sorry, Bill. These are the flowers I was telling you about. Let me see those. So many of, so many. All right, cool. How nice are they? I don't know, but they've been all over it. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you. All right, um, Peter, what's going on over there, Peter? Talk to me. No, things have been going uh, pretty well. Um, I, the two hives that I have have gained about, I don't know, 50 pounds, 40 to 50 pounds over the past, I don't know, five weeks, four weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but I was just wondering, I saw this last year, right about July 4th, uh, I think the weights kind of leveled out and then okay. started down. All right. And, it, and I was have, just wondering. You have, a hive, you have a hive, a scale, right? Yes. So just explain to people what your scale is doing for you and how you're using it. Can you do that? Okay. Well, yeah, well, actually, I, I could bring it up for a second. Sure, why not? This is a broodminder scale. So explain to people how, how it works, where this contraption is in your colony and how it works. Yeah, so it's that. So you're looking at the weight here. Okay. I know, but it's under your colony and it's yeah. measuring the weight, right? Yeah, so right now I have um, two supers. And I have uh, two deeps, two two brood boxes that are deeps. Okay. And you know a bottom board and so on. Um, and the scale sits underneath all that. Yes. So okay. Even if there were no bees, it would still weigh whatever something. sixty pounds something. or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, this has been typical. And then um, so the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is weight. Yes. All right, so it's it's way over time. So let's take a look at what happened in May there, like May 9th. But, but, but let's assume that through April and May, we had a pretty steady sort of weight gain. Um, but then something happened around May 9th and, and out, right? Yep, that's exactly right. Um, it, it seems what, at least where I live, 
you know, we had a few heat waves in May. May was particularly warm a few times. Mm -hmm. And the bees seemed to lo love that for whatever reason. <laughs> yes. Um, they kind of went crazy. Um, although you can't, well, you can't actually see the temperature here, um, but it's kind of confusing. Um, you could see the outside temperature. Um, and yeah, it gained a little, but there were some spikes in early April and stuff. So it is kind of confusing. Yeah. Now let's stick with the weight for a minute. And, and um, so, so we know that the com we know what the weight between April and May is a combination of brood build, right? Because if you look at April, down around 80 pounds, or no, it wasn't actually 80, but somewhere around 90 pounds, and it, it's gaining pretty steady through there. And that's a lot of that is 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 the buildup of brood, maybe a little bit of uh, honey they're bringing in in May, or or some other weight water or something like that. But then in May, between May 9th, May 16th, you're experiencing your first honey flow, in my opinion. Right. Right. So, right. so then- and, like, and like, I have notes here. So this was, this is due to putting a second honey where, super on. Where'd you put you your see first? this jump here. So yeah, that's about 14 pounds or I don't know, 12 or 14 pounds. Okay. But so where did you put your first super on? Sometime around- Somewhere over here. <laughs> I can't. All right, somewhere over there, okay. So somewhere over there, you had your first super, and then you're building honey, and now you put your second super on. 12 pounds, a super, a, a, a drawn comb super doesn't weigh 12 pounds. So um, so you you immediately start to gain, and you're still gaining, right? Yeah. Yep, it's still still gaining a little bit a day, you know, a little bit per day. But, but what's interesting is if you look at the other one, um, What's funny is this like sawtooth thing. So how much, it's amazing how much they gain and then I guess evaporate Well, the sawtooth overnight. Is, yeah, the sawtooth is, is that, that's normal. And the reason for that is that they have, they're bringing in, you know, you, you have timestamps on that. So if you look at the peak, let's look at a peak timestamp. So when is that? 1,700 hours. All right, so that would be five o'clock in the afternoon, right? Yep. All right, now that's seven in the morning, right? Yep. So what they've done is they've evaporated the water out of that honey overnight. Yeah, that's like eight pounds. That's pretty, pretty incredible. Well, I mean, you know, that's, you know, they, they get, you know, they, yeah. It's like, they're not net gaining much, but they are bringing in nectar and they're consuming stuff. So, uh, you know, I don't know where all of it's going, but some of the moisture is leaving that colony. You know, some consumption of honey and some moisture is leaving that colony over that period of 12 hours, right? No, it's not more than 12 hours. It's 13 to 14 hours, right? They can't, they're not foraging much after five o'clock at night and they don't forage right, the next right. morning until seven. So, I mean, some of it can be just plain old water too. So, but yeah, so you're seeing, it's hard to figure out what you're seeing, but you are seeing it, what I would consider a normal change in weight. But the trend is up. You see how the trend is up? If you look at June 11th on that sawtooth down there, if you put the thing on June 11th, the whole colony weighs, yeah, on top there weighs 154 pounds. If you go back down to the one we were looking at, you know, it's, you know, no, the other way. Yeah, the peak go, over yeah. there, you know. So see, see the gain, you know. So got on fifty four to one forty nine. That's like you know what, five pounds of honey, right? So it's gaining. That's what data does for you. Thanks. Yeah, Peter. and what's uh, yeah, what's pretty amazing. If I bring it back, kind of like the end of the winter, you could really, really see what's happening. All right, so what Peter has the scale that he paid for from Broodminder, and he's he's doing this technical stuff with his colony. You may not have um, a scale like this, but you can also do this with your um, not as accurately, of course, and and um, um, but you can do it by lifting the colony, you know, hefting the colony, lifting it up, and feeling the weight of it. Is it gaining weight or losing weight or whatever? You will never get the kind of precision that Peter has in the scale. But for years and years and years, 100 years or so, beekeepers have kept track of their honey supers and the gain in their honey supers just by lifting the colonies up. All right, so, but your question is about robber screens. What do you want to know, Peter? Yeah, so when I looked at last year, it was right around 4th of July that things kind of topped out and started downward as far as weight. 
Um, so just to, I guess as an insurance policy, would it make sense to just put robber screens on just to make sure in case anything happens or you think they're, they're just strong colonies and I shouldn't have to worry about that? Well, if they're all, if they're all strong, you shouldn't have to worry too much about robbing. But if you want to put robber screens on for the dearth or whatever, try it, put them on. It doesn't hurt anything. Your bees are going to have to learn how to use them. You know, so they, um, robber screens depend on a little gland in a bee's foot called the Arn Arnhart gland. And that provides footprint odor. And, um, and also the colony has a certain hydrocarbon smell to it. The, the bee's cuticle carries a certain scent um, based on the chemicals that are, there's the unique signature of chemicals that are in that colony. That's how bees can tell if, Another bee that lands on the board doesn't belong to that colony because they smell different. So, um, and then I'll chase them away. But <clears throat> so what'll happen is if you have uh, um, bees that uh, are belong to that colony, of course they'll they'll be let in, and then um, you you your robber screening. Uh, first of all, the bees that belong to that colony have the scent of that colony, and they know that they belong there. And they know how to get in, or they'll learn how to get in. They'll walk through a little gate in that robber screen. So they're following the scent of the colony. Now, robbers don't have the scent of the colony. They don't know where to go to get into the colony. They have to just fly straight in. So that's why robber screens work. And then, you know, there's a footprint odor that's unique to those bees. And other foragers, once they get on to the fact that other bees in their colony are using this passageway, they'll follow that footprint odor and they'll be able to get into the colony that way. All right, so if you want to put them on, put them on. And that would be early in the morning or late at night? You can put them on anytime you want. They're, already, they're going to confuse the heck out of the bees when you first put them on. So, but then eventually the, the bees that belong in that colony will find a way in. And then by the way, if you took the robber screens off, if you wanted to do a little experiment, the bees will still land near that entrance, turn around and walk down the front of the colony, just as if that robber screen was still there, you know, because they're following the footprint odor at that point. It's a really interesting thing. The older foragers won't learn a different, they won't come directly back into the colony. They'll, they'll follow the same path that they followed when they had to go through the robber screen to get it. It's really interesting to see that. Thank you. All right, cool. So Kathy, you have another question about your, your did you, we, we, did we cover this? The bottom two teeth are full cyanotic, queen excluder and a honey super with top feeder. So you, you don't put on, did you put a honey super on when you're still feeding, Kathy? Yeah, I know I'm not supposed to, but they were still eating it. They were still drinking the water. So, I mean, I know I'm not gonna be able to use that honey for honey, but can I, can I save those frames then to help winter them over with food? Yeah, you could use that for winter food. You just have to keep And then when they finally stop using the, the top feeder, then a different super. Oh, well, well, what did they, so do you have, do you have two deeps on it now? And yes. With all, drawn, yes. With all drawn comb? They're full they're between brood and comb, yeah. Yeah, well, so you don't need a feeder anymore. Oh, okay, okay. You don't need that feeder anymore. So, um, you know, just leave the super on. Okay, excellent, thank you. Yeah. All right, so um, Dan, Dave, you found you caught a swarm. What do you mean inadvertently? Was for your expertise that made you? <laughs> yeah, that was actually because I had a hive that died out late winter, and I left the hive out there. It had a, a lot of honey in it, actually, but I just with for various reasons left it out there and found a just last week found a new honey beehive in there. So. Um, just wondering if there's anything I should do to kind of make sure that it's, I mean, I'll do a, a hive check on it eventually, but uh, I'm, well, still, I'm still so, kind of. So you, you've in a hive that died over winter and a swarm moved in. Yes, sir. You don't have to do anything to it, except like you said, check it. Okay. Yeah, but that's just like, a, uh, that's just like a, a blessing there, Dave, you know? Yeah, it is actually, because I wasn't expecting to have any bees this year because that was my last hive. <laughs> So um, just a short story about Thailand. So in Thailand, the native species of bees in there, there's only one native cavity dweller, Apis serrana. The rest of them are um, all 
uh, bees that uh, live in open comb, you know, so they call them open nesting bees. But they have about 30 or so species of stingless bees, which are the cutest little bee. I mean, they're just adorable. Some of them are um, maybe a quarter of an inch long. Some of them maybe an eighth of an inch long. It's like 30 different species. Well, they are cavity nesters. And I was, um, I had a uh, stingless bee colony being made for me, just all the parts so I can bring it home and assemble it. So I'd have it as a sort of memento of my trip in Thailand. And I went to the factory where, it's a factory in the back of a, a bee yard. And he said, yeah, he said, we make bee boxes here and then we stack them up over there in the corner. And there's so many bees that populate uh, boxes and containers in Thailand that they end up populating the box after he makes them. You know, it's kind of it's kind of like the same thing that happened to you, Dave. You know, like the, you leave the box out there long enough and the bees go back in it. Now I have two swarm traps, one of them, I put up in a tree about uh, 10 feet off the ground, facing north in the deep um, shadow, you know, deep shade. And it got a swarm last year, late in the season. I was gone. And I came back a week and a half later and the colony was, full, the swarm box was full of bees. Now in that box, there was only two comb. So, you know, I know what happened in there. By the time I got around to um, thinking about looking at it, it was a full-fledged colony with, you know, five or six cone built out completely hanging off the top of the box. So I couldn't actually open it. Um, so I said, all right, I'll just let it go. And when it dies this winter, or if it does, you know, if it doesn't die to survive, I'll just let them live in that. And, uh, but it died, you know, as I expected, because about 75% of the swarms that occur in our environment die. You know, we only get a little small percentage that actually live through the winter. But like you, that that box is up there. I get back from Thailand, there's another colony. In it. So the same thing happened. You know, now there's another colony <laughs> flying in that swarm trap. So I couldn't have to have another year of not being able to open that box. So um, they're doing well though. All right, so um, what else do we have here? Nice job. Thanks. All right, okay, what do we got here? Anybody else? Okay. We have spider warts too, and bees are all over them. Oh, that's a plant. Joanne, spider wart. That's a plant, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's a plant. Blue, it's a blue uh, plant that has these spiky uh, long leaves. I don't think it's native. Unless, does anyone know? Is it a native? Spider war? I don't know. Somebody can look that up. We can see. I'll, if, I'll look it up. Yeah, we can see if it's native or not. I'm not really sure about that. All right, we got a little time left. Um, so let's take questions from the floor. Looks like we've exhausted the chat at this point. But um, um, what else? I mean, it is swarm season, so I expect I'm getting swarm calls. Um, uh, but uh, I'm sure that we'll see some Saturday. I think we'll see some indications of bees that want to hit the trees. I know in my yard, I wanted to tell you a little sort of, I, for lack of a better sort of term, I'll say a, a pro tip about swarm traps. If you, if you make one or two and put them in your, in your bee yard, somewhere close to your colonies now, the, the mythology about swarms is that they want to move a hundred meters away from their uh, home location. I haven't found that to be true, you know, um, uh, because I put swarm traps within sight of my bee yard. Some of them are as close as 20, 20 feet or so. And what happens when you have them up there, if you bait them right, make them out of a single deep, bore, put a solid bottom on them, bore a hole um, in the long end somewhere, and then put a telescoping cover on it and find a nice location in a tree between some branches or something where you can either hang it or, or wedge it in there, uh, put it on a rooftop, um, you know, like a top of your shed or something like that. You can do lots of innovative things where you put swarm traps up 
And what you'll do if you if you have uh, if you have them around, what it'll do is it'll serve as a sentinel for you for uh, indication that there's colonies in your yard that are ready to swarm. Because what'll occur is colonies before they swarm, they send scout bees out to look for suitable locations for the you know, swarm to actually take residence in, and that usually a swarm will go out in a couple different stages. It goes out as a prime swarm, which is the initial swarm that occurs in a colony. And that takes the mated queen that's in the colony and a good portion of the bee population, mostly young, with them. And they leave the colony. They've built swarm cells in the meantime. They leave the colony and then they bivouac somewhere high up in a tree. And then they find their way to that to um, that, that location, that they're the final location that they choose. But your swarm boxes that you put up will act as possible locations. So bees won't ignore um, a nice location like your swarm trap, even if it's very close to the colonies. And it, you'll see lots of swarm activity, lots of scout activity around the boxes. And that's the, the nice part about it is it's a, it's a great way to um, circumvent a swarm. If you want to prevent one, you, you're going to get it ahead of time. As soon as you see scout action around you, the entrance hole in your swarm trap, you'll know that something in your yard wants to swarm. You can go look through the colonies and you'll find the one that has um, swarm cells that are fairly developed, not quite capped, but fairly developed. And you can make splits, do lots of other things to avoid the swarm at that point. You know, so um, so it's so I, I actually encourage you to look through, um, you know, this possibility of make us don't buy those um, uh, paper mache swarm traps that they sell at the bee houses. Don't buy uh, nuke boxes for swarm boxes. They're not big enough. Mostly, um, bees like in the northeast like about a forty liter space before they move in and that's usually and that's about the dimension of a single deep and also i put in the middle of those deeps some older comb drawn comb in there just to give them the scent you can also put swarm lures in them you can do lots of other things um, to make them attractive to bees some beekeepers will put oak comb on top of the swarm box i don't i don't uh, recommend that because that can draw um, other unwanted uh, attention to the colony. So you keep it to old leathery comb inside. Um, no, don't put any resources in there. And then um, and then they'll, they'll act as a sentinel for you to figure out whether or not a colony in your yard is going to swim. Now. So Bill, sorry, on that note, if you have a, an empty new hive, uh, would that work as a swamp trap? Yeah, it would be, but it'd be kind of a waste for you to drill a hole in it. You got to get a, you, know, you have to get a, you can buy. So if you wanted to do that, what I suggest you do is you buy like a number two grade box from the bee supply house. You know, mm -hmm. not a number one grade. Mm -hmm. Buy the mm -hmm. cheapest mm -hmm. box you can find, you know, and put it together as a swarm trap. So a swarm trap is different configuration than colony with a bottom board, right? So a swarm trap, as I mentioned, has about an inch and a half hole. Let me see if I can find a video for you guys. There's a swarm box that I made, and you're gonna see a swarm go into that. And this is, by the way, um, what I wanted to say was that even though these are close to your colony, they, colonies, they also do um, catch swarms. So here's a, hopefully my voice isn't on this. Let me see if I can turn that volume off on that. Go ahead and look. All right, so this is a swarm happening. All right, so now this is gonna, I'm, I'm moving around to show you the front of the swarm box, hopefully. So you can see it's just a regular Langstroth box. Now there's a hole in the center of it underneath that handle. And um, if I ever get the camera steady, uh, you'll see that, you know, the bees are just like gonna go inside that box, right? So the scouts found this and said, this is gonna be our home. And I just jammed that in between the, uh, crotch of that tree, tree 
and then there, and there he goes, right? So, so there, you know, eventually what you what you would see if you watch this whole video is an entire, so I'm in the middle of a, thousands of bees, right? Swarming around me going into this box. And you can see basically on the tree trunk right over here, you can see bees walking up. See bees walking up, up the, um, bees rather walk than fly when they're part of a swarm, but they all flew from the bivouac to get over there. And I'm just giving you a close up. Of, you can see the bees, bees walking up the trunk of the tree. They take a turn when they get up to the box and they walk in and are going inside. In this case, the queen is probably already inside that box. See the hole they're going into? So, and you can see a piece of plywood I put on the bottom of that box. I have a regular uh, telescoping cover on top, All right? So that's what a swarm trap looks like. Now, previous to this swarm actually selecting this box, there was lots of action from uh, scout bees which was an indication to me that they were gonna they were gonna actually use this um, location as a final destination. All right, does that make more sense now? It does. I have a question. Um, uh, so that second swarm, neither I or Father Mark had a box for the second swarm. So we had he had to call another father to go and bring us a box. Sure. Um, after that, I felt like an impulse of buying a hive and buying deeps and being prepared for the swarm so that I could have the freebies. So I put, uh, I, I assembled a whole hive together and I put it right next to all the other three hives that I have. Yeah. And Father Mark said, are you going to fill that? And I said, well, eventually, but right now I just want to be prepared for the next swarm. And he says, if you leave it there, you may just get a swarm moving in there. Yeah, I mean, we, we, all, we all sort of fantasize about that happening, but it's rare. But it can, it can happen, but it's rare. It really is. I mean, I, I don't, I, that's why I think, you know, making sure it's baited with the right way is a, it's a little bit easier to do it. But bees will come to an empty box. Sometimes when you get really lucky, <laughs> they come to an empty box. I don't have that kind of luck. I have to usually work at it, you know, so, so, um, uh, so for me, it's a little different. I kind of try to, I try to help them find a location. Excuse me, Bill, can I ask a question? Sure. Wondering about um, when to, when to collect the honey. Is there any time like? Well, I mean, so the when, when the supers are full, you can collect the honey, you know, but that's, um, there's, there's, and that's just, I leave my honey on till the end of July. Oh, okay. no matter what, you know, because if you do that, if you leave your supers on till the end of July, or even into the middle of August, if you wanted to, if you run into a dearth, they'll go back up there and they'll have something to eat. If you take it off too early and they run into a dearth, then you can jeopardize their health, you know? Okay. Um, so it all depends on your area. And we had a horrible dearth, what's it, last year, maybe even the year yeah, before. Last year. Last year we had a horrible one. So, and then if you took your supers off in the end of June, say for instance, and they had no honey and they couldn't and they couldn't uh, make any honey because there weren't any floral sources around, you can kill them. You know, and some people did. They starved their bees. Um, so I would suggest being conservative about when you harvest your honey and don't. I would say leave it on till after the end of July and then assess the amount of honey that's in the brood nest too at the same time, Amy. You don't wanna, you know, once you harvest honey, you have to always make sure you didn't leave your colony with a deficit of stores because then you have to feed them. You know, so your job as a beekeeper is to make sure you don't starve them ever when you rob their honey. Lots of good honey seasons. The deep box where they're living will be packed with honey and also the supers would be full. So taking them, taking honey at that point is no problem. I take it in July because I usually get an, an August to middle of October flow in my area from goldenrod and not weed. So if those two floral sources materialize, it's safe to take your honey off of, in my area off at the end of July because you have all of August, they have all of August to forage on, um, on goldenrod and not weed which is kind of a 
bad thing to say, but not weed. <laughs> not weed is a horrible, um, a horrible invasive, but bees, they'll sustain colonies, right? So, so <clears throat> the rule is, you know, whenever you do, whenever you have, whenever you have full supers, you can take your honey, as long as you know what you're doing, you know, at that point, if you haven't taken all of their honey, they were dependent on all of their honey, that honey for them. Um, uh, and they don't have any honey in the brood box. If you take the honey and you have to backfill with, uh, at that point, two to one syrup, because it's late in the season and you don't want them to have to evaporate uh, one to one. You want to give them a source that they can store up right away. All right. So. Thank you. All right, cool. All right. So um, one last question and then we're going to wrap this baby up and then I'm going to see some of you, I think. Um, at the bee yard on Saturday, I hope anyway. Paul, is there anything else you want to say? Uh, is there anything I missed that you want to, you might want to mention? If you're still there? I don't think so. All right, cool. Um, you're not going to be at the yard. Be, be, uh, by the way, Paul is um, our bee yard person. He's He manages the bee yard. He, he tells me what to do and, and I do it. Uh, what? <laughs> um, uh, so he manages the bee yard. He cuts the grass. Um, Paul, where are the, I the bees? Where are the new bottom boards and the insulated tops? Do you have them? I have them. Yeah. All right. So you can bring them down at some point when you when you cut the cut the lawn and then leave them at my house, which is right down the road, of course. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, and I'll have them there. Um, sure. All right. Okay. So do we have anything left to talk about? Before we wrap up, uh, just just uh, one recommendation from Gregory about uh, Tom Seeley's Honey Bee Democracy book. Oh yes, wonderful book, and um, and um, has all of the uh, swarm processes in it, as Gregory's saying. Um, it's a great read. Tom's a wonderful writer, but yep. he's even a better speaker. And by the way, if you're if you um, want to learn a want to get a jump start and learn a whole lot about bees. Um, you're welcome to go up to the Eastern Apiculture Society's annual meeting, and that is at Ithaca College this year. It's close enough for you to get up to. It's not that far of a ride, and you will hear Tom Seeley speak twice about bees in addition to some other um, great scientists that we have working on many, many things. I think I looked over the program in, in uh, detail tonight um, after dinner, and I think it's really worthwhile for the $300 that they charge um, for you to go there. We have posted a link on the CBA website. Um, I'm currently the state's representative for um, EAS. Um, uh, John Baker is on the call here. He's, he has served loyally as our representative for EAS. So how many years, John, have you served for? Hold your fingers up because your mic is off or you might not even know I'm talking about you. But anyway, he's there. Um, and, um, so, so I think that's about it then, unless we had anything else, one more, anything else, anybody, anything else? No, no, I don't think so. Okay. Somebody joined us. All right. Great. Hope you have, uh, time to see our, our program lineup of speakers coming up and I hope to see you guys there on Saturday. Some of you at least. And join if you're not a member. Appreciate that.